So with this, uh, we uh, we cannot be more delighted to uh, be the host of today's uh, workshop to focus on the uh, environmental aspects, and the environmental justice, and also social justice uh, uh, surrounding the manufacturing of AI. Right? The, uh, the equipment uh, open times, we, we have a critique from this part of the world. You say, you say the studies of digital society and digital technologies in the, in the West, okay, it's because of the post-industrial post context. Right? So most of the studies, of course, there's a legacy in media and communications to only focus on the uh, symbolic, on the immaterial. But in this part of the world, we cannot forget, this is in Asia, okay, uh, this is why, you know, uh, for example, Shenzhen, you know, a city I have worked a lot in, is called the, the Silicon Valley of hardware, right, and most of the hardware uh, from uh, 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 semiconductor chips to electronic devices, or uh, rare earth minerals, right, and, and the assembly process for this hardware, they are, even though we call them the cloud, but the cloud is material, okay, is hardware. Without hardware, there cannot be the cloud, you know, or AI at all. So I think this is one thing uh, in uh, this part of the world where we uh, theorize, when we conduct research, we have to uh, uh, consider a few, a few four, four grounds, you know, uh, uh, because we are in the industrializing Asia not the, the post-industrialized uh, uh, West, even though parts of the West are now trying to re-industrialize. Right? And uh, so, the, uh, so with this, I cannot be, uh, again, um, uh, uh, more uh, uh, honored okay, to introduce our opening uh, keynote, uh, Professor Henry Yao, whom I have known and uh, admired for 10 years, if you remember, we met in uh, Oxford 10 years ago in the Economic Geography uh, Conference. And um, uh, in that conference, I, I have witnessed, I've only been to a few uh, geography uh, conferences and uh, uh, the, the work done by uh, Professor uh, Yao okay, uh, is uh, so impactful okay, and his team on uh, global production network, right? And, uh, and he is, of course, a distinguished professor from NUS uh, Geography. When I was at NUS, I want to thank uh, uh, Harry for being so supportive when I was uh, there. And it's even more wonderful to have you over in NTU to continue to uh, discuss your work. Um, that has been uh, really central okay, to a lot of the work when we study supply chain uh, in Asia and uh, globally. Including in you know your new book, I think it's not the newest, but uh, one of them that uh, uh, I enjoyed. Uh, many people in this room have read uh, "Interconnected uh, Worlds," right? And uh, so uh, I think with this, let's just put our hands together uh, to welcome uh, Professor Yang to start the keynote. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jack, uh, for your wonderful introduction and uh, for the invitation, as well as. Uh, Melissa Gregg, you know, uh, from the uh, Australian Research Council funded project on automated decision making and society. It's my great honor and privilege to join the workshop and to learn from each other. Um, yes, I happen to work on hardware, but of course, uh, I've known too much also about the so called digital turn uh, in today's world. And hence, it's very gratifying to, to realize that we have uh, like minded people who, who realize that the, the digital also requires the material. Yeah. So uh, I'm economic geographer by training, uh, of course, also in geography, as uh, most of you know, we have a huge concern for uh, the environment and sustainability. Uh, so I'm quite aware of the issues that, that will be discussed in today's workshop. Uh, of course, in my own way, I don't particularly work on this issue, uh, but it will be great to uh, interact with many of you, including my dear friend, uh, Josh, uh, over in uh, Newfoundland right now. Good morning, good morning to him, right? Or something like that. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I, I can't remember the time difference. It's, uh, it's the East Coast time difference, means, yeah. So it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's midnight probably. Okay, so without further ado, I shall um, yeah, give today's talk, which is really to give you a broad outline of the world of electronics production. Of course, trying to also offer some explanation of the ways in which uh, electronics global production networks are organized. Um, just prior to the pandemic, and of course, uh, some uh, possibility for post-pandemic uh, discussion. 
Okay, so let's see if this works. Okay. Yeah, if I use the arrow. Oh, okay, there is one more option is to press this. Okay. Some versions of the talk have been also given uh, earlier. So this one was when I was in Berkeley in May. And uh, and because I talked about TSMC, so it was reported in the, in the Taiwanese media uh, with a reporter in that talk uh, on Asia, at the uh, Asia Institute of Berkeley uh, when I mentioned about uh, TSMC and so on and so forth. Um, and also some versions of this were given at the uh, also in the same month uh, earlier at the Stockholm with a whole bunch of economists uh, who were interested particularly in the idea of uh, localization of production in Europe. So all the reshoring talks um, together with uh, policymakers. Uh, I mean, these are some of the economists such as uh, Mark Levitz and uh, Penny, uh, Penny Goldberg from Yale, who was just the former chief economist of World Bank. And this was um, together with the uh, Deputy Secretary General of WTO, um, Gonzalez, who, who was uh, there to, to talk about trade matters and former EU Commissioner for Trade um, um, on, on issues of interest to Europe. So as you can tell, Europe is very interested in how the electronics production networks can be reorganized. Most recently in Beijing, uh, the, at the launch of the Global Value Chain Development Report 2023, which is uh, available for download at WTO website, is funded by WTO, Asia Development Bank, and uh, Japan's JETRO, and China's uh, UIB, of which the chapter four was, uh, was given uh, to, to you for leading, but you can download the whole report. It has several chapters on, if you like, the sustainability of global value chains, which are, of course, done by economists, so you can imagine. Uh, the, the sort of stuff that they normally use in order to measure, if you like, environmental outcomes of uh, global value chains. So today I shall briefly introduce, if you like, the conceptual background in this body of work, knowing that some of you, particularly online ones, may not have uh, too much sort of background in this stuff, and then um, say something about the world of electronics production, uh, and then see if uh, we have time to uh, say a few words about future research agenda. The work that I'm presenting is based uh, uh, on earlier work uh, funded by NUS. Uh, we have a strategic run. Uh, then under the current president of Nanyang Technological University, uh, mm -hmm. our former provost became their boss. Mm -hmm. So when he was our deputy president, he kindly funded us uh, 4.95 million Sing dollar mm -hmm. to set up the global production networks at NUS, of which we have the funding to acquire some of the material that you saw in terms of outcome. So this is my idea to leave us. Uh, Neil is now gone to uh, Sydney. Uh, to, and then uh, some other colleagues when we gave uh, presentations to uh, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank uh, and many fund managers. Uh, uh, this is uh, 2019 BC before before COVID. Yeah. So, uh, and the work today also based on the conceptual work they have done with uh, Neil in the 2015 book, OUP book, that was really the theory of global production networks. And then uh, 2016, I've written a book with uh, Peter Kassenstein's Cornell Studies in Political Economy that tried to use that idea to explain the economic development, industrial transformations of East Asian uh, industrializing economies without just relying if you like, on the kind of developmental state perspective. So it's kind of going beyond the developmental state. It's a kind of international political economy. And some of you are familiar with the more recent book, uh, which is much more on you applying the 2015 theory concept to explain the world of uh, electronics production and of course the most recent uh, GVC report. Okay, let's begin. We know something happened and uh, of course, even with the virus, one of our dear friends cannot be physically here, Peng Hua, so hopefully uh, you don't get it. Uh, but this matter has troubled many of us, right? But also another matter, interestingly, when you have the American president holding that little thing, it's not the virus, the previous one, Trump is, would have, you know, hold the virus if he can, but uh, he actually got it, right? Yes. And then the Joe Biden was holding the chip that really now becomes a hot item. So both matters become part of a crisis of originally the public health matter of the pandemic to then chip shortages that led to tremendous uh, transformations in many industries, uh, including some of the industries that have severe uh, employment outcomes, as we will see later in terms of, say, automotive and so on and so forth. But there are other matters, right? Because of some of these uh, shortages, partly would be one of the reasons for today's high inflation, because of the shortages of supply of all sorts of goods uh, in order to cater to demand. And of course, we have, uh, unfortunately, two 
uh, wars going on, which makes the world much more uncertain, which in turn dramatically change the way we look at the future of many of these industries. These are just some of the parameters at play. Um, and what hands to me, it seems to me, it's a matter of having troubles with global production networks or global value chain. So this idea of trouble with, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, while well, your former boss, Mr. CEO of uh, Intel, was giving us a prediction sometime about a year plus ago that chip shortages will persist till the end of this year, which technically remains true in terms of auto chips, but not so much in terms of logic chips that are used in uh, smartphone and uh, computer devices. But of course, due to the chip shortages, it led to severe uh, impact on many industries and hence give you an idea how if you like, um, um, dynamics in one industry can have significant impact on other industries. And hence, uh, unemployment, uh, stoppage of production, if all the major automotive companies from Ford to Toyota to what have you, and so on and so forth. And one of the issues has got to do with um, the shortages of chip production because of the reallocation of capacity of existing chip makers when the auto guys decide to cut their order and hence the existing chip makers allocate uh, uh, their capacity to other users such as of course the severe demand for uh, laptops and smartphones during the pandemic because of essentially what we're doing now zoom based uh, um, presentations and teaching and learning and work so that led to many reconsiderations particularly in advanced industrialized countries uh, of what happened i mean why is it that you know, we now have to face this kind of uh, uh, troubles and shortages when, you know, we were the one in the U.S. Invented, invented the very integrated circuits, means the chips, uh, Intel itself, for example, as well as, of course, to Europe, which used to dominate, you know, uh, in semiconductor industry. Philips used to be 40% owner of TSMC when TSMC first started, right? So as you can tell, Philips uh, in the Netherlands had, had, has had a very long-standing um, background in this. So that led to significant policy initiatives, such as, of course, the US um, 52 billion uh, chips act and European uh, 43 euro billion euro um, European chips act. More chips will be good, right? So more, more not this kind of chips mm -hmm. that my dear friend Neil Cole likes to eat, uh, but the chips yeah. that you cannot eat. If you do, your doctors will be very happy. All right. Now, so let me say a few words about the sort of theoretical approach first before bringing you back to some of these uh, introductory observations, all right? So uh, we know the world is getting more uncertain today. We know there are many interpenetrating flows of economic activities one way or another. Question is how do we conceptualize it? Um, and it seems to me, uh, judging from the days when uh, Trump started the trade war 2016, that then we realized that the world actually uh, was and remains fairly interdependent on each other. The question is, in what ways? Through what kind of, if you like, backbone or platform? And I think by today, uh, we have done about almost 30 years of research since uh, sociolo so, uh, sociologists work, uh, Gary Giraffe and others in the 1990s, that the world get very interdependent through what's called global value chains or global production networks. Right? In short, these are the, if you like, backbones of the world economy. They are kind of not so visible, but once you start unpacking them, then you realize that, oh, there are such chains and networks. So, so really, we need to understand how GPNs and GVCs are the backbones, the platform, if you like, for understanding the global economy. Uh, in my own area, uh, because I'm involved in the, um, in the work on global production networks that actually build on global value chain, before that global commodity chain research, uh, I can say by today, this body of work together is one of the research frontiers in the social sciences. And GPN work tends to be more anchored in the discipline of uh, human geography, within which economic geography is the one of the mainstay, through which we try to explain right, the complex interconnections, interdependencies between different places, different places through which uh, economic activities emerge and connect with each other. And of course, have huge environmental, labor, uh, livelihood impact on the, the people and places where these activities feel like touch down and uh, articulate into or as we call it uh, strategically coupled with global production methods. 
Of course, as geographers, we realize how this kind of approach can help us to understand how activities at different geographical scales from the local, actually, if you want to, from the body scale all the way to localities, cities, uh, regions, macro regions, and the global scale. So this is, excuse me, one of our so-called frost cutting in scale terms uh, framework for understanding economic activities. Today, of course, I understand your interest is in electronics, so I'm not going to talk to you about coffee production networks as much as we want to have a seat or uh, some other kind of production networks. But electronics will be the focus today and based on the, uh, the recent work. Okay, so the world of GP and GBC research itself is also academically very interconnected. So let me say a few words about the concept, main conceptual framework, um, just as a value of introduction. Of course, it's been quite a long history, almost 30 years of research in the doing across many disciplines, ranging from early days of development studies, economic sociology, to of course, uh, later on, international cultural economy, uh, now economics as caught up in international economics, uh, of course, geography, where I came from, at Bonn and technology studies, uh, science technology, SDS, science technology studies, as well as also in business. So actually, it become very in social science now across many different fields, many different streams of uh, studies uh, based on their disciplinary interests, whether at firm level or at uh, worker level or at the national level, at development level, at the livelihood level, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you're interested, in 2020, we published a, a review paper in the Journal of International Business Studies uh, to summarize this mm -hmm. whole body of work. And the world itself is also interconnected. Now, let me say a few words about global value chain because this whole body of work started in the early 1990s uh, in economic sociology, arising from what, what's called the world system theory perspective. Some of you are, of course, familiar with the old days dependency theory and WT. Uh, world system for you, all right? Uh, and this body of work generally is interested in what's called the governance of global value chain, meaning who has control and power over the ways in which uh, a value chain is configured because it's seen as the one that controls the value chain will gain better, more value from the processes. So the original studies, like Gary directly in 1994, the original book that really revolutionizes the whole field has already offered the very beginning what he then called two governance types. You know? a commodity, uh, it was a buyer-driven commodity chain or producer-driven. So at the very beginning was a study of, if you like, US retailer outsourcing to Asian manufacturers and hence how Asian workers got beholden right, to American consumers through the so-called American lead firms, which are retailers. The retailers control, govern the chain. Producer trains are likely to be more high tech. So for example, in terms of then automotive manufacturing, then the, the assembler, the car maker themselves are the lead firms that then control the supply. So that was the very beginning, 1994. It's a long time ago, 30 years ago, right? So that's how the body work started. That's how I came across the work. That's how I was doing my PhD in Manchester, 1992 to 95. So my PhD supervisor, Peter Dickens, got hold of the book as early as 1994, and I got to read it at that time. <clears throat> There is Jerefi's original work. <clears throat> Followed by, of course, subsequent many famous uh, papers, including one I'm showing very briefly. And then subsequent to governance, then the next question you would like to ask would be, okay, we know now who controls what. Then the question is, how do we do better as a location, as a locality? So then the interest build over to what's called industrial upgrading, right? So and eventually lead to social upgrading research uh, of people like the Barrientos, from gender issues, development issue, and so on and so forth. So more recently, the work is on power, means to unpack further the kind of power in uh, global value chain in various studies. So in terms of scholarship, most of the scholars are very, very interconnected in terms of the body of work. Now in economic geography, we have developed uh, the so-called uh, global production network from the early 2000s, building on this earlier GCC global commodity chain and subsequently known as global value chain. Uh, by about year 2000. So there was explicit agreement among the researchers there to term itself global commodity chain because the global commodity had the world system theory background and so on and so forth. So they changed it to global value chain. And then at Manchester, we started the project uh, and that was termed global production network because we thought the word chain is a big sequential linear. So we thought network would be a better way of conceptualizing it. That's how we started. 
And in GPM world, we are we were originally interested in also power dynamics, but also as geographers, uh, together with a sociologist called Jeff Henderson, uh, we were interested in the issue of also embeddedness. Now, of course, some of you are sociologists, you know the, the, the whole concept of embeddedness from Mark Van Vetter to earlier work of uh, uh, Kalkalani. And the idea of embeddedness is for us to understand how localities get embedded in global production networks or global value chains. So we were interested in how, if you like, local foreign actors get embedded in each other's production activities. So you can see some of the early thinking is about 20 years ago in our earlier papers, in 2001, 2002, also in the journal uh, review of international political economy. And then in subsequent work, we wanted to explain how localities get plugged into uh, global production networks and the role of the state. So that's the strategic coupling and other approaches. And then by 2015, after Neil co joined uh, our department as uh, my boss, the head of the department, and of course, we co founded the uh, Global Production Network. Then we arrived at this book, which tried to develop the concepts of GPN originally into a global theory, which is Global Production Networks 2.0, as it's known today. Now, let me just say a few words about the key framework that we in is in this, if you like, 30 year old uh, literature, which is uh, in the 2005 paper by Gary Jeffrey, John, uh, John Humphrey, who's a development uh, studies person and film surgeon with economic geography at MIT, uh, on, it's called the governance of global value chain. So in this particular paper, um, they actually have um, sort of theorized five different modes of uh, GVC governance, but market and hierarchy are very obvious, right? So originally in transaction cost economics, it said that industries are organized either through market transactions or internalization completely within the same firm, known as hierarchy. So that one is wide, very well known. But what they have done is to offer you three additional ways of organizing global value chains, ranging from uh, the modular format, modular whereby production can be done in such a way that it's in modules which are perfectly sort of transferable across different products, which then um, can be outsourced to different component makers. So that's the original uh, understanding in particular industry and that use uh, the electronics at that time. Uh, relational tends to be industry whereby if you think of fashion, so leading fashion designer uh, together with say, um, they are makers, which can be highly specialized and hence very relational because the maker and the designer need to work closely together. This high-end fashion, I don't mean the the the, the unicorn kind, all right? I mean the, the Giorgio Armani kind, all right, so to speak. And then the last type will be what's called captive. Captive means the lead firm is so powerful that then the supplies become very completely locked into the lead firm. For example, 100% of your output goes to the lead firm, and hence you are completely captive to the your buyer, which is the lead firm. So that was the very beginning. Uh, this is about almost 20 year old framework, very influential in the literature. And, uh, and this is uh, before COVID, so we had the fortune of uh, uh, attending the conference, uh, Society, SASI for Society of, uh, for Advancement in Social Economics. That's the SASI conference with, where GBC community tend to gather, together GPN and so on and so forth. So this is Gary himself, John Humphrey, and Tim Sturgeon. And a famous paper published in the Review of uh, International Political Economy, more than 10,000 citations already on Google Scholar. Now, I had the fortune of being the handling editor of that paper. So my only little contribution was to have accepted the paper for publication. So, so I'm very glad that the paper became a prominent paper for the journal that I used to edit for 10 years. Yeah. So, um, and then the gang, uh, we, we gather, you know, last year when uh, Sassi in Amsterdam, and uh, so that's Gary, uh, jo uh, Tim Sturgeon, Gary Giraffe, and, and many others. I mean, those of you interested in, for example, gender issue, uh, Stephanie Barriento at Manchester, who uh, runs then the ESRC project called Capturing the Game, and she's very into gender issue when it comes to F uh, commodity chain, I mean, uh, sorry, GBCs in Africa. Yeah. So uh, agro-food, so for example, agro-food, anything from chocolate to uh, coffee to so on and so forth. And then, uh, and, uh, uh, Roberta works on uh, environmental sustainability of GBC uh, as well as uh, very as well. So some of these are other common scholars who in that body of work tends to embrace a lot about how GBC uh, organization uh, can mean very different uh, environmental outcomes, so on and so forth. Now, a few words about then the theory of GPN uh, in our work whereby what we wanted to do was to then identify some core factors that really drive the way in which 
uh, global production networks can be organized. And who are the organizer? Has to be the firms, right? Firms do the business. So in this particular theory, uh, Neil and I, Neil Cole and myself, we try to develop some of the core, what we call competitive dynamics, ranging from costs, but the, the word we use is cost capability. So it's not just about being cheap, but cheap and high capability. So if you're a supplier, you want to be not just the cheapest, but also you have to have high enough capability. So cost over capability becomes the real competitive arena. And what government, for example, can do is to improve capability of firms. So cost capability ratio is one core concept we use. Second is about market. So market access, market development is one reason why production networks are organized in a particular way. You will see some ramification later in the electronics space. But it's about financial discipline, which is to do with the idea of financialization. Right? Finance play a big role in a way in which different lead firms will have different, if you like, outsourcing uh, imperative. So American firms tend to outsource a lot more than, say, Asian lead firms. In the exact same industry, for example, in, uh, in laptop, uh, so you have <coughs> Dell, say, compared to Lenovo, which is China. And then in, uh, in smartphone, you have Apple outsource everything, and you have Samsung in source almost as much as possible. So exact competitor, but very different behavior, partly due to, if you like, financial market pressure, as we are the final. In semi point, there'll be another whole set of stories in the simulator. Final, the fourth factor is something that when we develop the theory, we thought it's important in the SN operating environment, risk environment, but we never thought it would be so important today. Right? Today, if you like geopolitical risk, is a singular imperative driving everybody. In many boardrooms right now, as we are talking, again, you know, the concern with uh, geopolitical risk, national security concerns, Trump's, Trump's, yes, Trump's everything, right? everything. All the other three factors earlier, unfortunately, used to be thought as much more important than risk environment uh, becomes uh, quite different now. But what we were interested originally was to use, it, use some of these imperatives to explain firm level behavior and hence the strategies they undertake in terms of whether they internalize more production intra firm or outsource more in terms of inter firm relationship. And so doing dynamics, explain strategies and hopefully development of them. As geographers, we're interested to know what happened locally regional and what are the geographical differences, right? And hence that was the original framework's idea of explanation is to help us understand what happened in Taiwan has something to do with what happened in Silicon Valley and vice versa. And you can do this in any other geographical setting to understand if you are a local problem, whether it's someone losing a job or someone actually having a significant upgrading of a household, right? has something to do with the work that he or she does and hence the kind of activity that this particular firm does, which in turn, the kind of value chain of production network segment that this firm is in, that industry connect to somewhere else. And that's the whole idea of this body of work. Enough theory. Now let's do empirics, all right? In the remaining time, it will be all about electronics. So let me say a few words about the original study. Uh, okay, so I'm interested in the hardware and uh, if you like ICT hardware, January things just before COVID. 2018 was one of the peak. The next peak was 2021 because everybody buying laptops and smartphones, right? 22 onwards, not so good. This year, not so good, actually. <laughs> but 2018, when I had the, the, the data, then you realize that ICT hardware, of course, is very significant. The global economy is about 14% of world merchandise trade. So 14% is very significant. Uh, interestingly, within this ICT hardware, 14% worth of world's Half, I mean, uh, uh, merchandise exports, about half come from PC and smartphone alone. So PC and smartphone are the biggest segment in global electronics. And later on, you realize even in semiconductors, about half of the world's chips go into just these two kinds of devices. And the most advanced chips, a lot of it go into smartphones for that singular reason, yeah? Okay, so my own study originally was done just before the uh, pandemic, so I was very fortunate that data were collected, all finished, and hence uh, COVID hit, and then uh, just say I want to write it up, right? And hence you see the product. So I was very lucky to be able to interview, uh, due to A to Z reason, a variety of big firms in each of the four segments. From semiconductors, the only exception, Melissa, is that no matter how I try, couldn't get Intel. Only Intel, I couldn't get interviewed. Okay, <laughs> all of the other major players, personal computers, uh, uh, say Apple, no go. Everybody, yes. <laughs> uh, smartphone, 
everybody except Apple as well. And consumer electronics, which is a uh, TV product, we essentially focusing on TV, rather than washing machines and refrigerator, things like that, all right? So say a few words about the electronics production network. First is uh, to talk about semicon followed by the devices. Now, semicon being an intermediate product that go into not just the uh, consumer products, but also industrial uh, electronics, machineries, and of course, uh, advanced uh, you know, military equipment, uh, aerospace, and what have you. Okay, semicon, uh, GBC or GPN tend to be organized typically in two ways. You either, like Intel, as what's called integrated IBM, integrated device manufacturer, means you design and manufacture chips, or you design and let someone manufacture the chips. Typically, there are these two. Historically, there were IBMs that also do a bit of outsourcing for other chip design and so on and so forth, but today, it's any separate, right? Now, uh, partly because the competition is very high, uh, technology level is very specialized. So Intel, Intel, oh, Intel also outsourced a bit of chips to TSMC, but by and large, Intel have its own production facilities. And then the, the ones that design but do not have in-house manufacturing facilities are known as fabless. A fab means a wafer fabrication facility, and the short form is called fab. So if you don't have your facility, you are called a factless, means you design, but you don't manufacture. Somebody has to have the fact to make the thing that you need, right? And we know a uh, company like Qualcomm that specializes in the application processor of your smartphone, uh, Apple designs its own chip, and then of course uh, AMD, of course they are the highest market value companies, uh, Nvidia that makes the GPU, the graphics processing unit that go into all the AI machines, and the $25,000 chip, is the high expensive chip that uh, NVIDIA is profiting on. And then you will outsource to people who make chips and specialize in making of chips. So he started the business model with TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company that started in Taiwan uh, in about 1986, if I remember correctly. 40% uh, owned by Philips, 60% owned by Taiwan government at that time. And Philips transferred the not so good technology at the beginning to TSMC. That's how TSMC started, right? Today, of course, TSMC wiped out Philips. Philips is still exists, but in the form of what's called NXP, if you're familiar with the industry. Uh, and then, of course, after they make the chips, whether TSMC, second largest now is Samsung. Samsung also has this facility. Then it goes into uh, packaging and so on and so forth, right? But what's interesting you want to know is the middle part. There are many, many highly specialized suppliers to the semiconductor manufacturing production networks, ranging from software people. Uh, it's called EDA, the Electronic Device Automation. Uh, so inside, without the PowerPoint, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, software on this computer, we can't really present the stuff to you. Without Zoom, we can't do this. We have to use another app, right? So there are very specialized companies. Actually, only three, four of them are all US-based. And then, of course, you have an equipment maker, the people who make the equipment that make the chip, and then you have all the material supplier that will look like this, right? And the most expensive one, and the one that is the top of the, of the town, is the famous ASML from the Netherlands machine that is as big as this whole panel behind me. It's the human, it's the machine, the EUV extreme ultraviolet machine that is necessary to make 10 nano or below chips efficiently. That's how it put efficient. You want to make it efficiently, you've got to have this machine. If you don't, you have an older generation, you can still make like what Huawei has done on 7 nano. But it's not so good. Now, if you go to ASML website, it's very a little bit obnoxious, right? They want to change the world one nanometer at a time. One nanometer. You know how small? One, okay, our hair is about one mm. One nano is one millionth of your hair. One hair, if you split one million time, if you can see it, I don't want to talk to you. You're not human, okay? <laughs> it's so small. And the most advanced chip now is made on what's called a three nano, means the different layers of the circuitry and the width between the two transistors is currently at three nanometer. And on the on the thumbnail of my fingerprint has for the most advanced chip in iPhone now 8, uh, 15 has roughly about a 30 billion transistor. You've got to pack 30 billion transistors in the circuitry in such a way that the width is three nano. Okay, so that's the technology we are looking at. It's extremely difficult to do it, and you need this machine, okay? And this machine itself has a huge production network. 
few hundred suppliers, many are highly specialized, it's only one company. So even this machine has lots of bottleneck. It's not like, oh, I have 200 million euro, I can buy this machine. No, I mean, Intel will have already bought up half, I mean, one third of the unit. So basically they can make only about 60, million, uh, 60 units a year at 200 mil each, okay? As the CEO himself said, this is a very expensive photocopier. Without this photocopier, you can't make that so finely printed circuitry, right? And hence, this is industry that is very complex, very specialized, but also impossible for one country to do it all. It's just not possible. This very machine itself, the one of the key bottlenecks is actually the lens inside. The lens is cow's eyes from Germany. For cow's eyes to produce 60 lens of this table big, they need many very skillful German workers to polish it. They just don't have more. They can only make 60 plus a year. They go into the 60 machine that are already bought, bought up by Intel, TSMC, and Samsung. Right? So even if you have quantum million, you can't. Can we divide that? Okay. Very good. So now I shall just skip the production network of Semicon itself to the electronics products. All right. Okay. So this is the electronics uh, device global production networks where I have the big firms such as the branding you know of in smartphone, in laptop, which decide on the key material parts and components that go into its own in house facility in case of Lenovo, right? Or in case of Samsung, or outsourced to. Uh, other makers, say uh, Foxconn for iPhone, so as Taiwanese uh, uh, ODM original design manufacturers that assemble most of HP as well as uh, um, um, as well as um, HP and Dell's yeah. uh, computers. Right. So basically, this is the production network, which is simpler. Uh, in my book, I've drawn up this figure to give you some idea of how the semi-com production network. Uh, connect with the device and that end up the, the finish mark, all right? So as you can tell, uh, let's say Intel, right? So this is Intel in uh, Santa Clara. And then of course you have the uh, the design software leader, chip uh, designed, manufactured, and then shipped to uh, device makers that put into uh, the laptop. I don't know, in this case, um, the CPU that then go into the, the computers that get assembled in Chongqing that you know eventually go into this. This is in case of Intel, but in case of Apple, designed here, manufactured in Taiwan, uh, that will have all the material, software, machine, and then go into Chongqing, assembled, and then go into uh, markets in Sydney or anywhere. So roughly this is what it looks like in a simple. Right? Now in the semicon industry, we know very well that the debate about Asia, or the phrase, America, Europe not making enough chips, is worrying many of the, the, the um, policy makers I showed you at the beginning. It's quite true by year 2020, if you look at the manufacturing capacity, Japan 15, South Korea 21, Taiwan 22, even the little Singapore now, we make about 10% of the world's wafers. You won't believe it, we actually make about 10% of the world's wafers. Singapore's total capacity is about Europe as a whole. In Europe, all the fabs add up is roughly the same capacity as in Singapore. Although all our fabs are foreign owned in Singapore. US is about 12%. Primarily Intel, Micron, and Global Foundry used to be AMD, Advanced Micro Devices, all fabs, so to speak. So you can tell in terms of manufacturing, it's true that US and Europe are much smaller, uh, smaller players today compared to, say, U.S. domination in the industry, the industry market share wise, U.S. is more than 40% because Apple's chips made by TSMC go back to being Apple's. It's Apple's brand. Yeah. So in that sense, U.S. still a primary dominant semicon market. It controls still vastly uh, many parts of the semiconductor value chain from the market to the equipment to the design software to uh, many other aspects, right? IP and so on, intellectual property, intellectual property. It's just the manufacturing one has gone much out of the US. And this table, you will have seen the same argument uh, in terms of US dominance in software, in IP, as well as in design of the chips. Two thirds of the world's chip design is done by leading US firms, ranging from uh, Apple, AMD, Nvidia, and so on and so forth. Um, the next one, next two are just um, 
showing you the lead firm names, which probably by now some of you, most of you are familiar. So let me then give you mainly the four main observations that I have in the study, right? In this particular industry. One is to say, if you look at the entire 2010s, just before the pandemic, we don't have a single way to, to sort of describe the geographical contamination. It's actually highly varied, depends on product category. So for example, advanced logic chips we know is very heavily concentrated in Taiwan, right? Taiwan makes more than 80% today of the most advanced chips. Uh, then the remaining will be Samsung in South Korea, Intel, depends on the Intel facts, whether in the US or Israel or uh, Ireland. So that's it. The most advanced chips are only made in these places, all right? However, if you look at uh, memory chips, it's heavily dominated by South Korea, right? With only Micron from the US having facts in the US and Singapore, as well as, of course, uh, Toshiba, uh, and another name is called Kyosia, uh, which is in Japan. So really, South Korea and Japan keep playing. Then if you look at local PCs, more than 90% of those local PCs are assembled in China by Taiwanese manufacturers. So this is heavy concentration, geographic. However, if you look at other kind of product categories, very diversified globally, TV, for example, you can't imagine TV all assembled in South Korea and China. It's heavy. I mean, this, this thing, you know, if it's meant to be sold in Brazil, it has to be assembled somewhere in Latin America, right? So actually, it's much more globalized. That's all PC, same. Even Dell has assembly plants in Latin American country to cater to North American and South American markets because the desktop PC is quite heavy, so on and so forth. Um, the next one is the fact, I will skip the data table, but just to give you the main sort of observations, is to say that the second observation is that, again, this is the industry electronics as a whole that has also very diverse ways of organizing intra-firm and inter-firm activities. So you can't say that, oh, everything is outsourced. For example, I've given you earlier examples that Apple outsourced everything, but the exact competitor Samsung makes all the smartphone devices by itself, right? In laptop, it's the same. You have yes. Lenovo that makes more than 50% in-house. Uh, Apple and others that makes uh, uh, outsource 100%. So in other words, you have very sort of diverse intra-firm coordination within certain lead firms and very diverse, uh, many others who adopt inter-firm partnership. In semiconductors, it's the same thing, right? You have AMD that used to make the CPU that compete against Intel, not so successful then, but then after it got rid of its fabs and sold it to Global Foundry, and now it's doing well, right? Because it outsourced 100%. So AMD, exact competitor in CPU, outsourced everything. In GPU, same. NVIDIA, AMD, outsourced everything. And then Intel does quite a bit of GPU, in and out. I know actually quite a bit of GPU also outsourced to TSMC. Yeah. So as you can tell, we don't have a clear, you can't say industry-wide that it's all outsourced or insourced. It varies by the firms and the kind of the networks they are involved in. That's the second observation. Okay. Then the third observation is to say Asia used to be the key site of manufacturing. We know that for a long period of time, even before the rise of China. With the rise of China, yes, Asia is the global factory. True. But based on my study, since the middle 2010s, Asia has also become the biggest market in market for the very devices we assemble in this part of the world. And hence, it's not inconceivable why chip manufacturing moves to Asia, because you want to be closer to the assembler, closer to the final market. Why? Because actually, China is the biggest market for smartphones now. Biggest, all right? So in many segments, Asia is no longer the one that makes and export to Europe and North America, but actually Asia is the biggest market in its own right. And hence, uh, success in any production network will have to cater for Asia location as the final sum of consumption. Final point, the fourth observation is that the industry we're looking at electronics used to be very boring. Whereas, I mean, what, what more to say, right? We thought, ha, huh, actually we didn't expect so radical technological uh, transformations in industry, ranging from, of course, the semi-quantum chip side to the configuration of product. For example, if you just think of uh, the iPhone uh, came out in 2007, revolutionized, right? The way in which we live now, so uh, the smartphone revolution is all quite recent, only 16 years ago, right? Things can change. Semicon also, we significantly affect many other industries in automotive, aerospace, uh, medical equipment, and so on and so forth. 
So the major challenges uh, we are facing is the kind of radical technologies that will shape, uh, including how you know uh, Nvidia being a, a, a chip maker, right? Significantly shape the future of uh, vision and how you you see the road, if you like. So this is what we try to do in terms of uh, GPM theory to explain using co cost, market, finance, and risk environment uh, to explain different firms and how they adopt different kind of strategies to respond to those competitive pressures. And this paper in economic geography in 2015 outlined the table. They give us some uh, ways to sort of conceptualize this. All right? So that's really what GPM theory and in terms of explanation. This paper is at thing OA, I can't remember it. So um, maybe just, I have only two slides just to lay out the future agenda is that, okay, so I've given you some idea how GPN theory can be used to explain the configuration, the organization of global production networks and electronics. Question is, when we talked about, uh, because this literature is very big now, there are times when uh, many or some authors attribute local problems to what's called, oh, this has to be a GVC thing, right? So what I hope we do is at least you've got to unpack the box. So GPN, GVCs are not easy, but you've got to unpack them in order to find out how local happenings connect to. And this for this, I have put in, 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 in the 2021 article in, in, the, in the, with the title, The Trouble with the Global Production Networks. I'm kind of taking uh, uh, Harry Wells, uh idea of the trouble with the, uh, the, the hollow scene. Yeah. And then, um, also explain the variability of the four drivers we talked about. And finally, I think the role of the state and institutional context will remain very important in shaping how uh, GPN and GVCs are organized. Um, the three research questions, the agenda, technology, network resilience, and politics, I think are significant. We will discuss it, I think, throughout today's workshop. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, let's see, uh, we'll have a whole day for discussion. Thank you.